God loves us. This is something that I've said before. This is something you've read in scripture before. This is something you've heard other people say before. But it's still probably not something we hear quite often enough. God loves each and every one of us. God's love is many things. There are many different adjectives or, or descriptive phrases we use for God's love. But this morning, I want to focus on four aspects of God's love. God's love is unbounded, dependable, righteous, and just. God's love is steadfast. And it surrounds us. And God's love is really central to the entire nature and structure of the universe. The problem is we don't live in a world that reflects this love. We live in a world, especially in our own community, our own context, our own country, in a consumer country, culture that sees all of life as a transaction. This can be illustrated very simply with an experience from my own uh, teenage years. I was talking with a friend of mine. They, his parents had a third vehicle. He was a little bit younger, I think, a year younger, and so he wasn't driving yet, but I was either had my license or was about to get it and desperately wanted a car. They had a third car, and I liked their third car. And so I asked my friend, ask your dad if he'd sell the third, the third car. It was a Chevy Blazer. I don't know why I liked it that so much, but at the time I thought, I could see myself driving around in that Chevy Blazer. And so he, he asked his dad and got back to me, and he, I said, what did he say? And he said, he said, everything's for sale. Now the question is the price. <laughs> and, and it was like, well, of course everything's for sale. What I meant was, can I afford it? But it was, it was a lesson that always stuck with me, that everything is for sale. The, there's the old joke the devil said uh, to somebody as they were leaving church, can I, can, I, can I buy your soul? And the person said, absolutely not, not for sale. And the devil said, repeated, and they went back and forth, and finally the, the devil said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give you $10 million. Think about all the good you can do with that. And the person thought about it and said, you know, it would be my eternal soul, but I could really, I could feed thousands of people. I'll do it. And so the devil said, all right, so $10 million, million you'll sell your soul. And the person said, yes. Said, and the devil said, well, how about for five million? And he said, but you, you just offered me 10. And he said, now we've established you'll sell your soul. I'm just now it's all. The rest is negotiation. <laughs> we live in a consumer culture. We have this. We have this podium. I have a guitar. Everything we have, we have because we exchanged that. We have this because we exchanged that. Most often we exchange money for things. But we get money in exchange for our work, our talent, our time. But everything becomes a transaction. We exchange our time and talent for money, and that then quantifies who we are and what we have to give. God doesn't operate that way. God doesn't operate within this framework, within this consumer culture. The psalmist appreciated this different level, this cosmic level in which God works. Hear the words of Psalm 36. The psalmist writes, your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgment is like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The opening words start out, your steadfast love, and it draws a connection between us and our maker through not only love, but steadfast love. If we just were to look around our Bibles, we would see references to steadfast love again and again, especially in the Old Testament, the 
Hebrew Bible. We find no other word functioning as well to describe God's character. For example, Exodus 34, 6 says God is abounding in steadfast love. In Deuteronomy 5, in part of the Ten Commandments, God says there would be no idols, but then promises steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me. 2 Samuel 22 depicts God showing steadfast love to David as one who is anointed. And then in the Psalms, we see it over and over again. Psalm 5, there's an abundance of God's steadfast love. There are more examples, but we will turn now to Psalm 36. And in the beginning of this passage, starting in verse 5, we see these four characteristics of God's love. The first one, God's love is unbounded. It, the verse 5 begins... Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens as high as high can go. In metaphorical or hyperbole language, this is super height, not the 38,000 feet of the airliner I flew home on last week. But as high as there is high, God's love goes, which is higher than the 38,000 feet that I was flying. In our consumer culture, transactions don't account for unbounded love. The popular question, well, what's it worth? That's what I wanted to know about the car, by the way. What's it worth? Not what's it worth to me, but what's it worth to him? Because what it's worth to him is what then I have to pay. But the popular question, what's it worth, makes complete sense when we're talking about things in our culture, the things that we think about. But this question doesn't even work when it's applied to God's love. God's love cannot be bounded by our understanding of worth or value. And at the end of the day, we get to the second word, dependable. God's love is dependable. It never ends. It never fades. It never goes away. No matter what we've done, God still loves us. It's reliable, consistent, and trustworthy. The psalmist writes, your faithfulness extends to the clouds. At the end of the 19th century, there was a biblical commentator named J.J. Stewart Perron. And he wrote, these are some of the most wonderful words in the entire Old Testament. Their fullness of meaning, no commentary can ever exhaust. Their fullness of meaning, no commentary can ever exhaust. This kind of love leads us to this conclusion at the end of the passage in verse 9. God is the fountain of life on which we can depend. The third word that I chose to focus on, righteous. God's love is righteous. Now, you may be righteous. And I'm not going to argue with you if you were to tell me that you were. I may even say that, yes, you are righteous. Sometimes. I'm, I'm righteous. I have moments of, of, of great righteousness. We all do. But I also know, and I know this about myself, I, only, I, I assume it about you as well, but there are moments when I'm not righteous. When I'm petty, when I'm envious, when I'm jealous, when I'm, and all those other things that the Bible tells us not to be. And the reason for that is simple. We, you, and I are fallen. We are not perfect as Jesus is perfect. Recall the reading from 1 John that we began the service with. Jesus is the one. Christ Jesus is the one who models this. The guy sitting in John chapter 2 with his, his buddies at the wedding reception. This is perfect righteousness, Jesus Christ. But you and I are not righteous all the time. The best we can do is have those moments or periods of righteousness, of holiness. God is righteous all the time, and God's love is always righteous. The first part of verse 6 says, your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. 
as we move through these characteristics of God's love, we have to separate these verses of trust from the verses of petition. God's love is unbounded, steadfast, and righteous, but the reality we experience doesn't always approach this perfection. Even though this morning we're focusing on God's love for us and for all of creation, it's important not to forget the importance of a plea, such as verse 10. Oh, continue your steadfast love. Why would the psalmist need to ask God to continue? Because there are undoubtedly times when we don't feel God's love. We can look around. We can look at our own lives. We can look at our experiences and recognize those periods when we felt alone, when we wondered, where was God? <clears throat> Where was God in that moment when that terrible thing was happening? Or where was God in Connecticut? Where was God when a loved one was sick and we wanted healing? The psalmist experienced those moments too and cried out in a plea, continue your steadfast love, God. And in those times, we too can echo the words of the psalmist and call out to our Lord. And then allow those words of praise from Psalm 36 to serve as a reminder of God's ever-present love, even when we wonder where it is and when we don't feel it. It is there. God is present. The second part of verse 6 reads, Your judgments are like the great deep. And they serve to illustrate the fourth aspect of God's love that I wanted to talk about. God's love is just. But where is the emphasis in that verse? Your judgments are like the great deep. Who is just? The, the verse ends with, O oh Lord. Your judgments are like the great deep, O oh Lord. That's how our English Bibles render them. That's how it translates it in the New Revised Standard Version. But it places the emphasis in the wrong place. As somebody is so fond of saying to me, the emphasis is on the wrong syllable. <laughs> in Hebrew, this verse begins with Yahweh, the proper name for God. And it's important to keep that order. It begins with God. God is the one who extends unbounded and steadfast and righteous and just love. The psalm follows the ancient view of a descending order, starting with the heavens, that super metaphorical height, as high as high can go, and then gradually working downward, clouds, mighty mountains, and then ultimately the great deep. And as a, it's a good reminder of God's love for us and the great depth of that love. Another commentator writes about this passage. In short, God's character is built into the very structure of the universe. Everything and every creature, humans and, as this passage says, animals alike, depends on God for its very existence and future. The affirmation is reinforced by the syntax of these verses, 5 and 6. The first word in verse 5 and the last word in verse 6 is Yahweh. In other words, God surrounds it all. This morning, as we worship God, as we are kind of well underway into 2013 now, let us be reminded of God's love for us, a love that is so many things, but a love that is especially ever-present with us no matter what is happening. We are God's people, those who have gathered to worship our Lord, those who call out the name of Christ Jesus as Savior. And as God's people, our challenge in recognizing God's love for us is to then reflect it and show it outward. Worship isn't just what we do in here. Worship doesn't end at the door. Worship continues as we go out from this place and reflect that light into a broken and 
and dark world. Let us take these different aspects of God's love with us, live them out, and show them to other people so that they can see them in us. You know, the interesting thing about God's love is if we pray and ask, God will give to us and allow us to be able to reflect our Lord's love more fully and deeply with everybody we encounter, even with ourselves.